Well, welcome to the multi-channel factual session, which for some reason I keep on wanting to call the multi-factual session, but I'm sure we'll have multi-facts in this session. I'm Cathy Newman. I've escaped from the Channel 4 News studio for the day, which is very exciting. Uh, with me, Rachel Job, who's Head of Acquisitions and Commissioning at the History Channel, and Hamish Mykura, who, I've got to read this out, Executive Vice President and Head of International Content and London Head of Global Development at National Geographic. I mean, that is quite a mouthful for a dinner party. It's truly, um, the, <laughs> truly the, the Peter Mandelson of titles, isn't it? That one? Yeah. But I'm sure it makes you feel very important. Yeah, but, like just, just the middle bit, <laughs> but just so, Rachel, you don't feel left out, you also have another job description, which is mountaineer. She's <laughs> climbed Mount Kilimanjaro. And also, I hear runner, uh, Edinburgh Marathon, is that yes, right? Yes, in yeah. May. So yeah. you're incredibly important too. Um, <laughs> Hamish, as far as your sort of um, life outside telly is concerned, you're a bit of a man of mystery. Um, no mountaineering feats that I've heard well, of. Well, I have been known to bag the occasional Monroe. Really? That's a hill, isn't it? That's a hill. It's just a hill, not a mountain. But anyway, we are going to be scaling summits this session. Um, and also, I'd like um, as much Twitter um, activity as possible so that uh, we've got lots to talk about. And let's start by, oh, the hashtag is TV controllers. Yes, TV controllers, there it is. Um, and I'd just like to start by looking back over the, the 12 months. Um, let's take history first. I have never seen anything. This stuff is so cool, and it's all in one place. The more miles we put in, the more stuff we find. Oh, no, no, no. It may be ugly and it may be tough, but we're part of this swamp. 100, 100, yeah. between the two. They live recklessly, they bid recklessly. Woo. In this business, there's thousands of years of history coming through the door every day. Yeah. I'm driving a ton! They were the first generation of the entrepreneurial rock stars. These were great men with a vision that nobody else had. Who doesn't know where they were when he came out of prison? Catch the miracle. This is the real big stuff. It's about achievement. And it's about upping the ante. That's powerful stuff. I have something that will change everything. Wherever they come from, they're not welcome in my kingdom. There are no lands to the west. That's your wall! Welcome to the party, <laughs> gentlemen. These mountains are my life. This land is my life. It takes a certain kind of man to live here. Roberts and men are like sharks. Always moving forward, and twice as lethal. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It is an unbelievable piece of history. This thing is cool. <laughs> Are you getting excited? <laughs> I'm digging it. Excited? Yeah, I'm excited. All this and more, right here on History. Well, Rachel, there's a lot going on there. Tell us who's watching it. Um, yeah, so the channel's been had quite an interesting change over the last few years. I think I was given a statistic the other day. It's something like since 2010, the ratings have grown by 82% or something, which is actually quite hard to fathom. But it's, it's really sort of tremendously gone sort of sky high. Last year was some ridiculous percent upon the year before. This year is the same again. We've grown tremendously, and I think a lot of it is down to there's a lot of the American content you see in that, in that show reel, and that's really, it's really strong, it's really high value, and I'm really sort of blessed with this supply of content from the US. But actually, we have now started to develop a lot more of our homegrown content, and actually that has brought in a different kind of viewer as well. We're very male channels, we're very, a lot of the channels in the documentary section of the EPG are, are male skewing. And it's more male than it was, isn't it? Yeah, it's, uh, I can't remember exactly the numbers, but it's about 60 odd, 65, I don't know if you've got it in front of you, 65%, and it's growing towards 70. A few years ago, we did try and go for sort of slightly more female, slightly more co-viewing, and actually when we tried it, it, it didn't work and we lost viewers. So um, when we kind of unashamedly be sort of quite macho and quite male, actually it brings in even more viewers, girls as well. And we do have some brilliant girls on the channel. Um, Lisa in Ice Road Trackers is one of the most popular characters on the channel. She gets more tweets than anything <laughs> I've ever seen. And also in, in uh, Grave Trade, which is a, a local commission I think we're going to talk about later, our main character just turned out to be um, Sarah, who's a brilliantly, wonderfully uh, 
articulate businesswoman. But by and large, it's blokes watching. It's blokes, well, yeah. Hamish, let's have a look at what you've got to show for yourself. Here we are. <laughs> That is so weird. It all happens here. This is a very, very sharp glass spike. We came here to test ourselves against Alaska. He's been shot. It's absolute panic. This film goes into details that are unprecedented. The Rubik's Cube. Only a seven-year-old can do it. Crappy. Oh, I hate you guys. Not trappies, peppers. Ooh. I'm preparing for the unexpected. For a series of terrorist attacks. F5 tornadoes. A massive earthquake. Corruption of our food supply. Collapse of the Greenland ice sheet. Jealousy is something that everybody has to work through. Explore on, Nat Geo. Yeah! <laughs> well, Hamish, gosh, a lot going on there. Um, do you... I felt with both those showreels, actually, the sort of history and geography are kind of colliding, which is... Interesting, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, there's lots of history, geography, and I guess anthropology as well in all its forms. I mean, I think for us, really, the big difference um, has been since 2012 that Nat Geo has centralised its international commissioning here in London. Um, and, you know, you were sort of taking the mickey out of me earlier on about all the global and international stuff all in my very title. very good good naturedly, absolutely. Um, but in a way, I mean, initially, uh, it, it took me a while to figure out what that really meant. And, you know, you, you, when you actually look at the audience for these programmes that we're commissioning here in um, 440 million homes and 171 countries, 48 languages, it sort of starts to sink in that you really are, you know, you're reaching... Uh, estimates of a billion people with some of these programs. And um, you're also trying, in a way, from my point of view, to commission programs that are going to be uh, as successful in London as they will be in Buenos Aires, as they will be in Manila, as they will be in sometimes in the USA as well. So you really are trying to, to formulate shows that can be genuine worldwide hits. Um, and and it's, a, it's a great challenge. They're both, both showreels strikingly blokey. We've talked about that with you, Rachel. Um, I guess what I'd like to ask the audience, actually, to get, get your heads around is um, via Twitter, hash TV controllers, pictures your sort of spoof multi-channel format uh, aimed primarily at men. So we want a kind of glib title, a pun, a great location. Um, I'm thinking sort of rap bastards or something like that. Um, I don't know whether you guys can come up with another um, idea. But if you could tweet us that, we'll come back to it later in the session and uh, see which are the best. So this is your big chance. Um, but it has to be a spoof. So let's we move on We might commission to... it, though. That's always you never know. That. Yeah, you never know. Um, let's look at one... I just, I'm just going to tell you a, a quick title story then. Um, the only program that I ever commissioned just on the basis of a title was from my old colleague, Simon Andre. Uh, uh, and he, uh, um, when he was uh, running his independent production company, he said, um, OK, the elephant in the womb. <laughs> and I think, I it. It's brilliant. It the elephant brilliant. in the womb. And, and, that's and that what became it was. a whole series of animals in the womb based on Fantastic. that one line pitch. So there you go. This is your big chance. Get those tweets coming in, and we'll come back to them later in the session. So let's get uh, come up with a show which sums up the channel. Hamish, just sticking on you for a minute. Um, let's have a look at a clip. You think you're in charge of your mind. 
Ever wondered how to make someone fall over without even touching them? Or how to make a pro footballer forget how to kick a ball? Or how to get drunk without a drop of alcohol? No way. It's our brains for the real boss. And we're going to prove it with a whole load of ingenious hidden camera experiments on the best guinea pigs of them all. And we're going to blow, blow your mind. A one-off special on Nat Geo. Think safely. So what blew your mind about Blow Your Mind? Uh, well, uh, there's a show that was commissioned in the US. So I guess I should just, if you don't mind, quickly explain how the structure of National Geographic works, because it's quite important in a way if you're pitching stuff to us. Um, Although of, we are going to come in detail to commissioning later I'll on. I'll just right? do it very briefly. The, uh, probably the, the bulk, 70%, you might say, of the content that goes on the international channel comes to me from the US. Uh, probably around 25, maybe a little more, comes from my commissioning here. And then uh, a smaller amount is commissioned locally within the regions. So I'm trying to tie in uh, what we commission with the stuff that's coming from America and the stuff that is commissioned in the regions, make it all feel like it belongs in one place. So the, the biggest hit of this year for us has been a show called Brain Games with uh, Jason Silva, which is a fantastically entertaining program, which is about perception and how the mind works, but it's full of kind of visual tricks, optical illusions, uh, ways in which you get deceived and, and, and really kind of magic in a way that, uh, um, when, you're watching the, uh, when you're watching the program. And that uh, um, was uh, clearly going to be a big success. Uh, it was something everybody was very excited about in the US. So from my point of view, it was a great opportunity to commission some shows that would run alongside that, which were in the same kind of territory, which would uh, um, work uh, as part of our offer. So we, we uh, uh, were able to commission a number of programs of which um, Blow Your Mind was one. And Blow Your Mind, in a way, is about the physical, uh, the physical deceptions of the, of the body. There's a great sequence where there's a waitress holding a tray. And by simply gently moving the walls on either side of her, she'll immediately stumble and, and spill the uh, drinks over the customer. Wow. And uh, it's just about the way that we, we perceive movement. But with a number of these great... Home. Yeah, exactly. In fact, yeah, I think this evening we'll be seeing a few people doing <laughs> a similar kinds of, um, of stunts. But um, uh, so, so that's been a great thing for us. And, you know, uh, again, um, Brain Games was our, when it did launch, was our best show uh, for five years, the biggest launch that we've had for five years, um, and uh, a huge hit. Well, Rachel, let's have a look at your show of choice. Earth to Earth, ashes to ashes. Working with the dead. The job is 24 hour, seven days a week. You never switch off. Can sometimes get a bit foul. We was at the grave and they had to chuck a chicken across the grave. This car, it's a three litre diesel. And I went in it, easy do 130. But not that we ever go fast in these. There's a lot coming up in our brand new series. Gently rock it side to side and pull it towards you. Grave Trade, Tuesdays at 10 on History. So how did uh, death bring your schedule to life? Yeah, so, I mean, that's very different from the sort of loud, boisterous, manly um, show we saw earlier, isn't it? Um, so, yeah, this is our biggest hit of the year, actually, that's been from the, from the local commission. Um, and not surprisingly, it skews a little more female than a lot of the other stuff, which well, is a good thing. Why not surprisingly? Um, I think, honestly, not surprising from my, my point looking at that promo, really, I think. Um, but are women more morbid? Uh, apparently, yeah. So apparently, statistically, if there's a death in the family, the woman is more likely to organise a funeral. Um, so, and there are moments of this. It's a real kind of very sad at one point, extremely emotional. You're, you're with the family that they're dealing with this huge death and that there's grief. Then next to, they need to get the coffin finished in time and they're kind of hammering it in and they're rushing against the clock just so they can go to the pub. And it's, a, you know, it's their office like anyone else's. But actually what's really key about this series, which is why it works for history and why it's absolutely right for history, is you've got this sort of old doc um, character-driven element, which is the funeral directors, but you've also got exhumation. So you've got essentially the archaeology of the dead. So you've got the people who put us in the ground, people that dig us back up again. And with each episode, we juxtapose two stories within each of these worlds and actually marry them together thematically. Well, I was going to say that from your showreel, I mean, there was very little history in the showreel, wasn't there? So that's um, interesting that you bring up history there. Yeah, so, I mean, it's, it's interesting how people define history. And I think um, we made a real point of emphasising our characters on history because we love them and actually we feel them as being really memorable. But actually, the history is still there. These, these people are, are... Most of the people on the channel are... Like, um, really, really knowledgeable about history. They know a lot about um, the subject, they know a lot about the past, but actually it's delivered to the audience in a, in a less um, formulated and formatted way. So something like Porn Stars, which is a huge success on the channel. Um, Rick Harrison, who runs this porn shop, is a very successful businessman, 
Um, he, he, you know, he didn't go to college. He's not particularly well educated, but he knows so much about history, and that's why the audience loved him. And I don't think, you know, I don't think we should apologise for not having lots of white middle class professors on the channel talking about history in the way that he reminds you of school. Actually, Who can you be talking about? Yeah. Um, <laughs> right. Okay. Well, let's have a look at a, another couple of shows. Uh, first, Nat Geo's. Uh, uh, well, I want to call it as many have come fish with me. fish just took off. Whoa. Unbelievable. Look, he is burning that reel. <laughs> you got a monster. Just stay on him. He's taking us down river. We can't do anything about it. <laughs> that thing is huge. He's going up river again. He's going up river. He's going up river. Oh, jeez. I thought fishing was supposed to be fun. This is like any shit. Ah. Hang on. Ah. Come on. It's been over half an hour since the fight began, and the fish shows no signs of letting up. Oh, he's going again! No. <laughs> God! Wow. Holy! Oh. 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 What a fish! <laughs> <laughs> After an epic 40-minute fight, Sean can rest his arms. The battle's Whoa. over. Whoa. I've uh, spent a lot of time in the Fraser River. What was that? Was it a shark? Uh, it, it is the um, tenth largest sturgeon ever caught in the Fraser, Fraser there River. There you go. And uh, that guy there, had, uh, the largest fish he'd ever caught before that was about that size. Um, and the, yeah, the format is that there are basically three fishermen, each of whom thinks they're probably the best fishermen in the world. But how will they fare uh, in the territory and on the waters of another, uh, another fisherman? So they go on three international expeditions, and one of them emerges as the winner overall. And um, what, what, um, how important are, I mean, we saw, you know, I can't remember the name of the guy hauling the sturgeon out of the river there, but um, lake even. What, how important are characters to these kind of programs? Well, I mean, when I arrived at Nat Geo, the, the channel really was in transition towards a kind of character-based uh, uh, form of programming. And I mean, I think the problem on multi-channel factual is that if you are doing single programs which are just really content-led, it's very hard for people to form the habit of watching. Even if you've got a great three-part series, people can watch it three, part, three times and then it's gone. And then they've got to find something else and make an engagement with that. So I think all these channels are now making uh, much more likely to be commissioning longer runs of programs. The aspiration is that you'll be able to make a show which you can bring back for a second run and a third run and really turn it into a kind of big part of the schedule. And there's no doubt in my mind well, the best ways to do that is with great characters. And if you can have characters who people really like and want to make a date with and want to come back and see more of, um, then you've got every chance of making the series run and run and run. So it's really probably the number one objective um, for what we're trying to do is find programs which have got either great presenters or a great ensemble of characters at the heart, uh, the heart of them, um, which really can give the program longevity. And, and also just give it a kind of, um, of ease of access and often the kind of entertaining quality as well. I, I think there's um, always a risk on, on National Geographic that, uh, and on all these channels that uh, programs can become a bit somber. And I think trying to make them entertaining is a really big part of what we're doing. There's nothing, nothing somber about the sturgeon. Um, now, the next clip from history um, brought the channel its first nomination for a broadcast digital award. Let's have a look. I'm Johnny Vaughan, and this is Steve Brooker, otherwise known as Mud God. On the Thames foreshore lies over 2,000 years of history just waiting to be discovered. Steve's agreed to share with me his decades of knowledge, searching not for buried treasure, but for hidden history, as we become Mud Men. The dirtiest show in history. Mud Men, coming soon on History. Mud every day. Rachel, why? Well, we, I was sort of moaning about the lack of history, but I mean, they're, they're, that's answered me, hasn't it? Why, why does this work? Um, I mean, his, Midman was really a game changer for us, actually. It was our first big, big sort of successful local commission. We're now three years into three, three series in, three years into it. Um, I think it, it took history, it took, it, was, it took the character idea to the next level. Steve Brooker, who works with Johnny Vaughan, um, He's, he's a window fitter from Woolwich. He loves history, didn't really understand it at school. He's a mudlarker. He goes down on the river and he digs for stuff. And, then he, and he just says, I just want to find out more about the stuff that I find. So, and so him and Johnny Vaughan, off they go. And actually, you know, the one thing that 
turn this into a commission was the Johnny Vaughan connection. And at the time, um, he was doing Capital Radio. Um, he, he, Big Breakfast was many years ago. So for him, it was the perfect thing to do in the afternoon when he'd finished his morning job. And actually, I think even we didn't realise the association with Johnny and history was actually going to be so brilliant. And he's done so much PR for us over the last three years. It's been brilliant. So, But actually, no, it's not even presented by Johnny anymore. It's really just Johnny and Steve mucking around and having fun. He's just one of the mud crew. He's not even a celebrity anymore. And that's what's so great about it. But do you need a British star for these kind of shows? Um, not necessarily. I think um, uh, we need a we need a memorable character. We need a memorable face. I think the the character bar. Hamish is talking about characters. I'm talking about characters. Is is being raised for sure. So I think they need to be bigger. They need to be louder. They need to be more interesting. They need to be credible, which is really important. Um, do they need to be British? Probably for us. We have a lot of American content on the channel. Um, we don't necessarily need another uh, American star. Do you agree with that, Hamish? Um, well, uh, uh, to, to, I mean, I think um, um, largely I, I do. I mean, and I think the great thing about the, the Johnny Vaughan show is that it, it works brilliantly in the UK. But I mean, I would look at that program and I would have a question about whether it would transfer internationally. It's a sort of London-based show uh, with, with, with uh, a quite British frame of reference. And from my point of view, we're always trying to, to, to find ways of making the programs work um, across borders effortlessly. And what's the thing that makes it land in every country? And again, I suppose, you know, for, for a show like, like Mud Men, you're not uh, broadcasting it outside of the, uh, of, of, we, of we are, actually, Europe, yeah. so. Uh, well, actually, we broadcast, we broadcast across Europe. And actually, the, what we did for, um, for example, in Poland, we took the guys to Poland and we did an episode based in Poland, which went down very well in that, um, in that territory. I mean, we don't broadcast outside of Europe. The distributors sold it pretty widely, actually. And I think I agree with you about sort of tra uh, um, traveling, content traveling. I think London's quite unique, though. I think London does do very well all around the world. And I think with the Olympics last year, that series sold particularly well for that reason, I think. Just before we move away from formats completely, we've got a great um, Twitter spoof idea coming through. Snaking bad snake handlers in New Mexico. What do you reckon? I'm impressed. No? Snaking bad? <laughs> mm, maybe. <laughs> Keep trying. Deadly snakes. Um, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Okay, so the next clip, uh, moving away from uh, formats, but staying with factual, clip from history, um, a foreign documentary. Um, Rachel, tell us why, why we're looking at Miracle Rising in a minute. So uh, Miracle Rising South Africa is, is, was really unique to us. So we, we, we are very much a series-led channel. <laughs> Tamish was talking earlier, the multi-channel world, it's about grabbing an audience and keeping hold of it. It's very hard to do when you're at 500 and something on the, <coughs> on the EPG. Um, so one-offs are not something we do very often. But when someone comes to you and says, I want to tell the story of um, apartheid in South Africa, and, and how they were on, on the brink of civil war. And actually, this was this one man who turned it all around called Nelson Mandela. And I've got these amazing contributors um, who, who are willing to take part. Um, suddenly, it becomes actually a no-brainer, really. And it becomes an international story. So we should play the clip. Let's play the clip. Years and years of people not feeling like they were equal. It left me breathless. This first free, fair, democratic election Lesson of South Africa has such global repercussions. This was big history. Turn them out to a miracle. Breathtaking. Miracle Rising, Monday, the 11th of February. Catch the miracle. Coming soon to history. So, Rachel, how does Miracle Rising fit within the rest of your factual slate? Um, it, it, it fits really well. I mean, we, we, we have the channel is called History for a start. Um, I think when we talk about um, celebrities, we talk about uh, characters, and we talk about faces. There's a lot of faces in there. We talk about stories. The word, you know, history does have the word story in it, after all. Um, and I think it's important as a channel that now and again we do something that really is um, event-driven, that it's, it stands out there and it grabs attention. We do have to, you know, we do have to make some noise in this busy world. And I think now and again, the, a couple of one, and we're literally talking a couple of one-offs a year, um, will really drive attention to the channel, remind people that we exist. And it's not just about... Um, these, these fun, buzzy, buzzy characters. It's also about doing something that's, that's really uh, amazing and re really brilliant stories. Yeah. How can people find it, though? Because it's different from what they'd expect if they were tuning in. How do you market that? Um, the, to be honest, the celebrities marketed it for us, really. We had a lot of Twitter activity. Um, certainly in South Africa, we had a lot of famous South Africans and lots of South African politicians getting behind it. We premiered it in South Africa first. 
for that reason. And we did a big screening at BAFTA. So, and we obviously got a lot of broadsheet interest as well. So it's a different approach to the marketing and PR teams, but I think it, it just adds breadth to the channel and just shows that actually we're quite an ambitious channel with quite a, a wide breadth. We're not just about long-running series is other things to us as well. Well, Nat Geo has also been making history in the form of a feature-length film. Let's have a look. 9.45 a.m. President Kennedy is in New York to celebrate <coughs> his 45th birthday at a star-studded event. It's going to be a huge birthday party at Madison Square Garden, a huge arena. Across town, the world's number one sex symbol the actress Marilyn Monroe prepares for the performance of a lifetime, singing happy birthday to the President of the United States. There was no bigger star at the time than Marilyn Monroe. Happy birthday, Mr. President. Well, Hamish, would Nat Geo do more sort of drama documentary type things? Uh, yes, is the answer. Um, you know, even if we manage to move our, uh, our programming to, you know, get to 70% or more series, that still leaves a lot of space for single films and, and one-offs and specials. And I think that the, the issue is always how do you make sure that a special really is special? And you know, in the US, they've got this great phrase which they use talking about a special. And a special is something which smells like a special. And it even looks a bit like a special, but when you get close up to it, you realize it's actually not really that special at all. And um, you know, I, I'm trying to get rid of the specials. It's really a big... Uh, a, 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 big uh, objective of mine of uh, one-offs which just sit there and even though they might be great great films it's very hard to bring anyone to them and get anyone to even know that they're there or write about them or find them so they can just get lost amid the noise and one of the best ways of making your special special I think is to find anniversaries that really work or big events that really are going to be a talking point and often that involves a, a major uh, film from the US, which we can build around. So for the um, uh, assassination uh, anniversary, the 50th anniversary of JFK's assassination, um, the, uh, the, uh, our colleagues in the US have made this great film, Killing Kennedy, which um, in which Rob Lowe is going to be JFK. Uh, and uh, having seen some of the early rushes, he's amazing. <laughs> um, apparently, he's annoying his own family by staying in character and speaking <laughs> in the accent uh, um, 24 hours a day. But um, with that uh, major drama, which is something that will just absolutely get loads of publicity and so on, it's a great opportunity for us to do, for an international audience who probably don't know as much about JFK as the American audience do, um, we can do other programs around there which will, will effectively form part of a season um, and they're much more likely to get found and get watched because of this of the event and because of the big drama and that one that we saw there is made by blast films and it's a uh, film in which there are seven vignettes seven stories about the big events in jfk's life that made him the person that, that he is his early illness there's stuff about his um uh, uh, uh losing his pt boat in the in world war ii where he nearly dies in in action uh, there's the, the uh, nixon uh, famous nixon interview um and a number of other of other ones of these stories which effectively it's like everything you need to know about jfk in in one long film watch this film and you need never watch another about, uh, about JFK for an audience who, who probably need more of a primer. Um, so, you know, we're, we're, we're always looking ahead. What's the next anniversary? What's the next big event? How can we, how can we make our specials special and not special? Well, we're going to look ahead to the next year in a minute, but there's, there's a great tweet here from Paul Bridges uh, with a format idea. Rosetta Stone Roses. Ian learns Urdu in Pakistan whilst Manny tries to wrap his head round ancient Sanskrit. Better, better. Yeah, improving. <laughs> Keep them coming. <laughs> well, well, let's look at what's ahead in the year to come um, and starting off with what's already commissioned. Um, you've both commissioned um, a programme about our place in the universe. And who better to talk about our place in the universe than Sean Ryder? My mission is to seek out those at the forefront of UFO research and through them try to discover how other people deal with this most mysterious phenomenon. I'll be meeting the top dogs of ufology, from generals and scientists to the abductees themselves, to hear what they have to say and to separate fact from fiction. And that's clear as daylight, that. Well, it is. This is one of the strangest, mysterious things that I've ever seen. <laughs> he said it. Yeah. Uh, you got any more where that came from? 
Uh, uh, not really, no. I mean, I think there's a couple, uh, a couple of things milling over, but certainly it's an area we are interested in exploring, excuse the pun, a little bit more. <laughs> I think the combination of somebody like Sean Ryder, who you would never expect to see on history, I mean, his, you know, his reputation <coughs> is not, to, you know, not factual television, let's face it. Um, uh, paired with something like UFOs, it's the pairing that's so brilliant, I think, actually. And th that kind of pairing is absolutely something we're, we're looking for more of. Um, Did he make any great discoveries? Um, I don't want to say too much, because I think the PR team have got a strategy, but there's a couple of little mm. things. Yeah, yeah. That's good. Um, and actually, he's, he's wonderfully knowledgeable about UFOs in a way... We were talking about this earlier, but in a way that you wouldn't ever imagine. And he, when we talk about sort of people that you don't expect to look and act like experts, he's, he's one of those. And actually, when it comes to UFOs, he is pretty much an expert, and he does ask all those probing questions of all these supposedly uh, abductees as well. So he's, um, he's a good host, and he does talk like that all the way through the programme. Like he's shouting at you. Um, because that's how he talks, because he's so enthusiastic all the time. Is there a bit of a, a credibility challenge with UFO programmes, though? I think there's a lot of fun with UFO programmes, and I think there's a little bit of um, suspension of belief sometimes with UFO programmes. I think one thing we do talk about in the series, and Sean talks about, is actually UFO just stands for unidentified flying object. It doesn't mean it's an alien. It just means we don't know what it is. And, you know, the universe is massive, and statistically there probably are aliens at somewhere in the universe who probably have visited at some point in our history. So we just, we just haven't got the evidence. So I think there is a, there's an opportunity to have a bit of fun there, but also bury it in, in real science, yeah. Well, Hamish, your clip is at the other end of the scale, your metaphysical clip. Um, Carl Sagan's Cosmos, an update. We're on this speck called Earth around a star that's average in an undistinguished part of the Milky Way galaxy, one of 50 or 100 billion galaxies in the universe. If you are weak of ego, that might make you feel small. But in Cosmos, that is the biggest thought there is. In 1980, a groundbreaking series changed the way we looked beyond our world. The original Cosmos was a generation ago. And you know something? There's been a lot of documentaries since then, and I don't remember one of them. But I remember Cosmos, because it wasn't just science. It was why science matters. Now, we're rebooting Cosmos for a new generation, and you won't believe who's taking us there. Seth MacFarlane. The great thing about the original <laughs> Cosmos was that it reached such a mass <coughs> audience, it transcended the educational audience. He's teaming up with world-famous astrophysicist and educator Neil deGrasse Tyson. These meteors have been hitting us for years, but sometimes in unpopulated areas. Most of which the surface of the Earth is. You know, when you say it like that, it makes me sound silly. <laughs> <laughs> well, Hamish, it looks amazing, but how do you go about updating a classic? Well, uh, so how many people in this room have never heard of Carl Sagan's Cosmos? Ah, you see, you're not alone, Kathy. I thought I'd drop you in it. it. Well, that's, <laughs> that's revenge, isn't it? That's revenge for the Munros. <laughs> the revenge for the Munros <laughs> and the title. <laughs> um, um, so Cosmos in the US, it was a, a massive, massive uh, part of their kind of cultural history. This show in, in uh, the 1980s in which Carl Sagan did a really kind of popularizing series about uh, uh, the universe and, and, uh, the, um, and cosmology. Um, and, and that played in a lot of countries around the world and a lot of places you go. And Britain is like unusual in the fact that it really wasn't a big phenomenon here because we had, I guess, James Burke and people like that doing the, the same thing. Um, it is this sort of really known phenomenon. And the, the fantastic thing here is that of all people, Seth MacFarlane, um, uh, you know, for, of, of Family Guy and presenting the Oscars fame, um, just was obsessed with this and, and really wanted to do a remake. Um, and so we've been able to team up with Fox in the, in the US and just make this on an absolutely massive scale. It's really, in, in terms of, of, of its scope, in terms of its ambition, in terms of the CGI, in terms of its budget, it's just absolutely uh, on, on a different scale from anything that we've, we've really done recently. What's the budget? In the, past. the budget is very large. <laughs> <laughs> What's the budget? It made me perspire when I heard it. Um, More than a million dollars an hour? Um, it, quite a lot of money. 
That's a yes, then. Um, so uh, the, uh, the, this, this program, I think, is just going to be a great one for us because it's something that we can really get behind and absolutely market and promote. And again, the strategy that I was talking about to you before, build other programs around it and make it into, a, uh, into a, um, a, an event that can kind of run and run on the channel. And also, you know, as with Brain Games that I was talking about earlier, it's really good to be able to have hit programs that are also kind of core to what National Geographic is. You know, any, we'll take any hit, a hit's great, but if you have a hit that is absolutely on message with what that yellow rectangle stands for, that's worth much more. And so tr trying, to, trying to find hits that are really right in that area of being you know, smart and, uh, and intelligent and about the world around us, um, that's what really works best. Well, I'd like to watch this one, even if I'd never heard of the first one. And in my defence, it was a long time ago, and I grew up without a telly. Uh, I was a deprived you're too child. Young, you see, too yeah, young. yeah, exactly. Um, now, just um, going back to formats, which we've obviously touched on already. Clearly, a staple of multi-channel TV. But Nat Geo has—you've uh, been experimenting with a, a presenter-driven format, which is a bit different, isn't it? Let's have a look at the clip. I'm Vinnie Jones. In my time, I've been a football hard man, an Hollywood tough guy. But in this series, I'll be facing my toughest challenge yet, as I work alongside the guys doing the toughest jobs in Russia, working in dangerous and incredible locations across eight different time zones. VIP, eh? Covering some of the world's harshest terrain. We just suck! I'll be up against men with fearsome reputations. Some I'll remember for the rest of my life. So, what kind of character is big enough to hold together a format? I mean, is he a bit of a one-off? Um, Vinnie Jones it, it has got uh, quite a substantial international profile with it. With the, you know, um, as a footballer, he's, he's widely known. As a, as a Hollywood actor, he's widely known too. Um, we're very, you know, Alaska has been rating really well on, on the channel in the US and on a lot of channels. We have a number of different shows about the outdoors and about survival in, in Alaska. And uh, we've also found that r programs about Russia tend to do very well for us too. And uh, as um, um, Hannah, my team here, was saying, Russia is kind of the world's Alaska. <laughs> and uh, for an international audience, it's one of the last wildernesses. It's one of the places that you really perceive as being tough and dangerous and untamed. So um, uh, Vinnie Jones, who's a, who's a really enthusiastic fisherman, was really keen to go to Russia and, uh, and, and explore the place, do some fishing and do some, um, some uh, see, seeing how he You did he come fish with me up. as well. Then. Could have done, yes, exactly. Um, uh, to see how, how, he was, how he matched up to the toughest men of Russia. And so he went out there and um, uh, it, it's, it's a lovely series. I must say the, um, the reindeer racing pile-up is one of the most <laughs> astonishing things I've ever seen on TV. And Vinny I'm emerges unscathed. That. I couldn't say the same for all the reindeer, but Vinny, is, uh, Vinny manages to, uh, to come out of there intact. Um, well, Rachel, it's got to be a, a star or a character as big as someone like Vinny, hasn't it, to, to work for a the um, whole format? I think yes and no, sadly. I'm going to give that kind of vague answer. I think... Um, I think when we talk about driving, driving through and, and punching through, I think um, taking a celebrity talent really helps, in that whether it's Vinny or whether it's Sean, whether it's Johnny Vaughan. Um, and, and that really helps the marketing and PR teams. But also, it's about growing your own characters as well. I think that's something that you need to invest in. So I think, certainly from my point of view, I'm not asking for either or or both. Well, I'm asking for both, I suppose. Um, uh, what we really want is great characters. If they happen to be famous, that's helpful. But just sticking a famous person in a show, it's not, that's just not enough. They need to have a real passion for it. Or at the very least, they need to be able to talk very eloquently, be credible. Yeah. Well, from one famous tough guy to another, let's have a look at Vikings. I will not risk my ships on such a deluded fantasy. This was the most exciting voyage of our lives. I have dreamed of it. In the name of God, who are you? I have something that will change everything. Rachel, what attracted you to that? 
Well, yeah, so, so this is drama. So the interesting thing about this is it's drama and we're a factual channel. Um, we are doing more and more drama these days. It's not something that I commissioned, sadly. My budgets don't extend to that. It, it came from the US channel. But I think it gives a really good example of the ambition of the channel and the, and the entertainment values of the channel. And, you know, the American channel are making shows about stories that are very European in focus as well, which I think is quite interesting. Um, they've, they've commissioned a second season already. We'll be showing this next year. Um, I think it's, it's, you know, we showed the Kennedys a few years ago in history, which did phenomenal, thank you, um, numbers for us. Um, and I think this will too. I mean, I, one of the reasons I included the clip is because Alex made me, because he really wanted to see it. So I think the anticipation behind this series is, is really fantastic. And I think that probably actually helps me to talk a little bit about um, a, a one-off um, programme we're actually announcing today, called, uh, it's, it's got a working title of Bannockburn, um, and when we're talking about one-offs um, and we're, we're talking about historic battles and it just made me think about sort of medieval fighting. Um, so the Battle of Bannockburn, and I was talking to Hamish earlier, of course, being a Scot, I feel like a bit of a fraud because every Scot knows about the Battle of Bannockburn. <laughs> English people less so. For the, for, so for the English in the audience, it was the last time the, the Scots whooped the English, which was 700 years ago next June. Um, so big anniversary next June. Um, and the one thing, it, it's, it's more than just an average anniversary piece. And, and I like the special idea. It's not a special. And the reason it's not a special is because... Um, it's going to be done in a very, very expensive graphics, uh, graphic novel style approach. It's, it's more drama than documentary. There'll be a few talking heads. Um, but also, um, it's, next year, as we know, is the vote for Scottish independence. And it's actually, you know, it's the time when the Union of England and Scotland will possibly once again be broken. So I think a, a time when it, um, Scotland and England f fought together in battle. And actually, the Battle of Bannockburn secured Scottish independence for another 300 years. So it's a really key point in Scottish history. So next year... That, that battle will actually be really important and be really newsworthy. So all of a sudden, when we, we, we have a programme on the channel about ba ba Bannockburn, it becomes a lot more relevant to us. Well, let's talk about what you're looking for in terms of commissioning. Um, obviously, Hamish, as your enlarged title suggests, um, you've launched a new London-based commissioning hub. Why? Uh, well, the... Um um, I guess the short answer to that really is because London is a fantastic place for factual programme making, and the UK is a fantastic place for factual programme making, and you know the the, uh, um, the the scale and range of companies here is is excellent for us. Now it doesn't mean that we'll only commission from London, from or from the UK. We we you know we'll commission from Europe, we'll commission from uh, uh, Australia, from Asia, from Latin America, and we do have commissions from those areas too. But th there's no doubt that particularly when you're looking for programs that are, that are often formatted, that really know how to use characters that are edited with the kind of pace and energy that, uh, that, that these multi-channel, these, uh, these mail-skewing um, digital channels now require. You, you need good produ producers, you need the best producers, and you need the best directors and the best talent, and this is a great place to find that. And I mean, I, I, I have a huge amount of respect for some of the programs coming out of the US now. I think there's a preconception in Britain that our TV is better than their TV, which has just been there for years. And actually, as I've got more and more familiar with some of the, of the programmes that are now real hits, these kind of um, uh, uh, often quite blokey, often character-led programmes, the, the Americans are great at doing them. Um, they, 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 they kind of get entertainment, in factual, to an extent which I think we could learn a lot from. But, but I'm really trying to follow, to follow that lead. Um, so this is, a great, this is a great place to be. It's a great place to be, uh, to be based. Um, and also, I suppose, the other answer to your question is just, um, as, as Simon Dixon, who's sitting here, put it, um, I'm trying to increase the ratio of humans to wildebeest <laughs> on the channel. You know, it is about trying to make it led by, by people and characters rather than being just about animals and places. Although, of course, I could say we also have the National Geographic Wild, our, our sister channel, which we can place the, um, the, wildebeest the wildebeest on. Although there's probably much more character on that channel as well now. They're, they're both moving, moving in the same direction. Uh, Rachel, how does your commissioning work at History? Um, so, yeah, in terms of the... So I'll explain the global situation as well. So, um, uh, any, U, any Networks UK, History is one of our, our portfolio channels. Um, we're based out of London. We run channels across EMEA. So, um, that's Europe, Middle East and Africa. We don't uh, run the channels in the bigger European territories like Germany, Italy, Spain, France... Um, we are joint owned by Any Networks in the US and B Sky B in the UK. So we have this kind of brilliant kind of 
um, mothership in, in New York that produces these most amazing programs. They are, the history in the US is such a juggernaut. It's so successful. It's a, the, mo the number one nonfiction cable channel. You know, it, it produces all this brilliant stuff. So, so about 70% of the channel in the UK is the stuff that they make. It's high, high volume, it's high quality, it's great budget, it looks great. So the stuff that, that we commission locally it needs to sit alongside that, and it needs to sit alongside that well. The budgets aren't quite as high. Our budgets are growing quite a lot. For the one-offs that we've talked about before, they're, they're, they're quite substantial. Um, so I'm looking for ideas that really um, don't try and compete with that. I don't really want another transactional show where you're buying and selling objects, because we have those, um, unless I'm doing a format, so Porn Stars UK launches next week. So um, I'm, what I'm really keen to to find is stuff that, that, like I say, punches through and drives that PR and marketing. But I also have the benefit of tapping into all the international global history channels. So Porn Stars UK, as an example, it's a UK format, it's a UK show, but actually I'm only putting in about 55% of the budget because all the other channels came together, we co-produced it together. So we have the best of both worlds, really. We're part of a massive global organisation. We're supported in the UK by Sky, who are obviously huge as well, but actually we can act really independently as well. So it's a good place to be. What's your budget per hour for factual it, um I, I generally say around 50, 50K. Um, it, it can move a bit either way. Um, usually if you say a number, then people give you a budget exactly on that number, which isn't always good. But just to give people an idea, um, we have gone higher. Um, uh, if something we can get global partners in, we'll go considerably higher. Um, on the one-offs, we're looking more like 150, 200. Hamish, I mean, I know you wouldn't tell me about Cosmos, but generally. No, we weren't paid quite as much as we, we pay Seth MacFarlane, but um, uh, more, than, uh, more than history, I would say. I mean, remember, the, show, the programs that we're commissioning are, not, are, are for uh, uh, all markets, and if we're taking all rights for markets right across the world, we're paying, I would say, you know, it, in, it varies from program to program, but in the kind of ballpark that a terrestrial channel would be, would be paying for, uh, for uh, an hour of TV. Um, and, you know, we've got a, a growing commissioning team that, 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 you know, you can pitch to Ed Sayer, Hannah Demidovitz, Carolyn Payne in the team there. We've got Claire Runham, who's the production coordinator, who's a great person to uh, send your ideas to, who can pass them around the, commission, the commissioning editors there. Um, and then also Maggie Rhodes, who's based in, uh, in the UK as well, who does all our acquisition and co-production. So there's really, you know, really a, a big team there now, commissioning and generating, uh, uh, getting in content. Um, um, and uh, uh, not all of it is for every market. We do do deals on some territories and rights and so on. But in the main, we're commissioning for the world. That's our, um, that, that, that's our footprint. And can indies retain any rights in the programming they give to you? There's all sorts of different deals that we've done in all sorts of different circumstances. And quite often, we will take um, programs for the world, but not for the US. Uh, there are some programs that just don't work for our colleagues in the, in the US. Uh, and then the, there's, there's opportunities to do rights for no, the North American market. So there are various ways of, of cutting it. But you know, in the main, we're, we're looking for all rights. And I have to say, there have been very, very few um, uh, producers who've actually come in and said, look, sorry, can't do business with you because our business model is based on retaining the rights to the, the format. One or two have, but, but actually, it, it, you know, for, for the, the scale of exposure that you get on National Geographic and for the budgets that we pay, I must say I haven't found that, that seeking all rights has limited supply in any way. Rachel, is that the same for you? Um, no, we don't. We don't seek all rights um, because I don't. Um, I, I, I really support producer retaining the rights to their content. Um, I mean, maybe that will change, and I'll be sat here next year eating my words. I don't know, but I think at the moment, I think it's important that producer retain some control, and I, I think giving them some kind of ownership as well really means you get their heart and their soul more. Um, if, if there is a co-production deal out there, we often co-produce with Canada or Australia, or I'll bring in all my, my um, equivalents at the other channels, we might come in and take more rights, but that will be for more money, so it's always... Well, we're going to have questions from the audience very shortly, but I can't go without uh, looking to the future, so far into the future, in fact, uh, that we're looking at the end of the world. There's all kinds of dangers. Earthquakes. Catastrophic collapse. Supervolcano. Total destruction. EMP. Terrorism. The Pass. end of the world as we know it. Go. That's great, it starts with an let's earthquake. Let's go, let's go. Oh. This is your emergency preparedness toy store right here. If the world comes to an end, I'll be eating some good stuff. The extent that my wife and I go to is probably, let's say, insane. Fast, 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 fast. Commit fire. That's the Bible, folks. Here's to the end of the world. I just want to be ready. It would be like somebody instantly flipped the switch on the world. 
So I, I couldn't go without having a little can look I, at that. Can I say a little bit about preppers? Yeah. So, the, you know, what are the doomsday preppers doing on National Geographic? Well, you know, in some ways, anthropology is the fundamental thing that, uh, that, that National Geographic has always been about in, in terms of the magazine and its long history, geography and anthropology. And one of the ways that I would define what we, one of the key things we're looking for are brilliant subcultures of the modern world who are living amongst us, who are doing amazing things, who, on, in terms of when you come to scrutinize them more closely, turn out to be way much more interesting than you thought. And this has been a fantastic series, actually, a, a number of series now, about the doomsday preppers, who are these guys who live in the, mainly in the west and midwest of, of America, who are preparing for doomsday. So rather than going on a caravanning holiday, they go and live in their buried bunker with their 850 tons of stored food and their three armalites, and they teach, the, you know, whilst, whilst their wife knits the, um, uh, the, the fabric for the curtains, they teach their kids how to blow things up and uh, you know they, they make of them what you will they're a fantastic subject for um, for documentary making and uh, these doomsday preppers have worked brilliantly and as with kingfishers and some of our other series from those doomsday prepper programs great characters emerge who will then become central in subsequent um, more kind of character led character following documentaries so we've got we've got a great program i love it called mm -hmm. the castle coming up, which is about a doomsday prepper who is going to bequeath this enormous Elizabethan, Elizabethan style castle, which he's constructed out of breeze blocks on a mountaintop in West Virginia, to the member of his family who is the best prepper. It's like kind of King Lear for, for people with, um, with high explosives in their underwear. Um, <laughs> King Lear with breeze blocks. With breeze well, blocks. Look, I, just want to, I just want to take a few questions from the audience. We've not got a lot of time, so if everybody could be succinct, please, and please say where you're from. Um, there should be a roving microphone. First hand to go up is here in the front here. Um, there's quite a few hands. I'm sorry, we're not going to be able to take too many questions, but. Thank you. Um, I was just wondering, um, you, you mentioned. You can say who you are, please. That'd oh, be sorry, my name's Conor McGregor. Um, and I just want to ask a bit about your own, when you commission your own shows, do, do any of these shows any go to get to be broadcast in maybe the US or any other areas around the world? I mean, how does that sort of work? Um, I mean, it depends. Uh, quite often, yeah. Um, uh, very much, it, it's my commission. Uh, I, I decide what the editorial of that commission. It's made for the UK channel, or it's made for one of the channels in Europe that we c we control. If someone else wants to be involved, or there's an angle, we did something last year on the Falklands War anniversary. So I spoke to my equivalent in Argentina. He was very interested, and we did a co-production with Argentina on the Falklands War, which was actually mind-blowingly brilliant. But because it was this bizarre scenario, so it depends. I don't think the, you know the other channels automatically take it. We would like you to retain the rights to stuff. So I might put you into with someone and say they're interested, sell it to them. But, uh, but it's about whether there's an interest or not. Uh, question right at the front here, lady with auburn hair. Hello, my name's Judy Craig from the Screen Office for Fife and Tayside in Scotland. Um, I'm interested if, you, if both of you uh, also facilitate co-production. If somebody comes to you with an idea and you feel that the budget is beyond your own individual budgets, do you also help that or do you expect people to put that together themselves? Uh, Co-production is a huge part of the way that we, that we uh, uh, put our, our programming together. And, you know, we are um, particularly often keen to co-produce with uh, in America and Canada because if we have a show which is for international, isn't going to run on National Geographic in the US, and some of them do, some of them don't, but if they're not going to run on the, U on the US channel there, then that whole market becomes a, an available source of funding for us. But we've also co-produced in Australia, we've co-produced in Europe, we've, um, uh, we, we've done a whole different number and range of deals. Plus, we're very happy to pre-buy, we're very happy to do straight acquisitions of programs as well. Um, all these models can work for us. And I mentioned before Maggie Rhodes, who's here, uh, and she really is the person who, who, is, who is a linchpin in making all these deals work and knows the market very well. Um, and uh, so, yeah, we're always uh, available to have conversations uh, about those kinds of co-production deals. Question right at the back. The mic wending its way. Hello, uh, Peter White from Broadcast Magazine. Um, uh, Rachel mentioned that she, you, you weren't uh, interested or, or able to do uh, straight drama in, in the UK, but I wondered the same question for, for Hamish, perhaps, given the, the Killing Kennedy and, and those types of films. Is that something that you're looking to do in, in the UK out of your, uh, your hub? 
fixing his, should I, his should mic. I answer oh, it's, it's right. Right. Nash, should you go there? <laughs> Are you okay? Uh, you, you might have to do you want me to ask that again? again. Yeah. <laughs> so Rachel uh, mentioned earlier that she wasn't able to do straight drama out, out of the UK, but but I wondered the same question for you, Hamish, whether you were able to do straight drama out of, uh, out of Nat Geo. Uh, the answer to that question is no reason why not. Um, you know, if for the right drama project, uh, uh, which I would feel would work well, where, where I would feel the scheduling would be appropriate, the idea was right, there's no reason why we couldn't do fully-fledged drama from here. Um, you know, clearly, we're never going to do, do uh, uh, to become a drama channel. We're always going to be a factual channel with some drama in the mix and some docudrama in the mix. And it's about really finding the best, re the best form for any idea. But, you know, I I'm always interested in experimenting with form in, in, in lots of different ways. And if people come in and suggest a quiz show, or if people come in and suggest a, um, a, a, a format show in a studio, again, um, if it's international enough, uh, if the idea is right, there's no reason why, why we would say no to any of these things, um, uh, even though our bread and butter is still going to be the, the character-led documentary. I think, and I think it's important to never say never. So I don't want to, yeah, I can completely rule out drama. But I just think budget-wise, I think to do drama well, you need to, you need to invest a lot, of, a lot into it. And I think at the moment, I would be reluctant if someone came to me with this very ambitious drama idea on my budgets. However, if they've got a clever way to do it or they've got a co-production deal on the table or some other way, then absolutely. Thanks. Rachel Job. Hamish Makira, thank you very much for all your time and, and all those lovely clips there. And thank you, the audience, for listening. <laughs>